Uh, Mr. Kushra Khan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. Nice, nice to be here. Well, to begin with, uh, I know that in uh, 2009, February 2009, you were appointed a special advisor to the board of Satyam soon after a major scandal uh, broke over there. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our audience all over the world will be very curious about your impressions on what really went wrong and uh, what you and your role were able to understand about how India can avoid such situations again. Well, um, when I took the assignment, everyone said I must be crazy to, to take on something like that. But um, I found uh, within a few days that it was a very fine company. And uh, it was just the actions of the promoters which, which brought it to its sorry state. But there were 40,000 people who worked very sincerely for this company, did a phenomenal amount of good. And uh, I really felt I, I, I was glad a few days later when I took the assignment because I found you know there's so much you could do in a positive way for revival of this company. It was a great company. It's just very unfortunate that a promoter could do something like what the Rajus did. Um, how do you prevent such things in future? Very difficult. I think um, we can always legislate, you could always sort of try and put tighter rules into the system, but eventually it comes down to basically the, the philosophy of the promoter, and this was a blatant fraud, and it was clear that, you know, there was an intent to deceive, and it was done over eight years, very systematically, very methodically. So I, I don't think there can be ultimate safeguards against this sort of thing ever happening again. But I suppose there will be tighter regulations in future, and certainly people will have to be a lot more vigilant about these sort of things happening. Right. Now, uh, uh, considering the fact that you have seen governance in, in a lot of different uh, companies, uh, were you surprised that the fraud went undetected for so long? And, and uh, w could there have been any red flags that people could have paid attention to to yeah. bring this to light sooner? See, in retrospect, it's always very easy to say, look, surely somebody should have noticed this. But it was a very, very well thought out, meticulously planned fraud. Uh, the documents were forgeries. Most of the documents put before auditors were forgeries. Uh, one could say that, look, the auditors are responsible for really checking on things, and therefore the, the, one of the key uh, areas of blame lies there. But then again, you don't know exactly how, how they were sort of lured into this feeling that everything was hunky-dory. Um, it, it was a very difficult situation. The Indian government and, and, and the people on the board have received tremendous compliments for the way in which the whole Satyam situation was handled uh, and the way in which uh, jobs were not lost, uh, clients were not driven away, uh, and, and a new buyer was found. Uh, what sort of lessons do you think can be learned from that whole experience? We sort of we, we sort of structured our entire exercise into three buckets. One was uh, the customer which is very important because we had to make sure customers didn't walk away. We had to look at the people because a lot of people were very anxious, very uncertain about their futures, and of course the cash. It was a very, very illiquid company in a pretty dire situation in terms of liquidity. I think when we went in, I wouldn't be surprised if they had just about two weeks of cash left in the organization. So getting some cash inflows into the company, em emergency loans, was extremely important. Um, I think one of the things which um, we realized uh, fairly early on was that we needed to work very fast. Because if this thing was allowed to fester and drag on for a longer period of time, uh, it could have been disastrous. So it was a tough choice. It was a choice which, I mean, some people said, look, are you guys going to do a fire sale? And we said, no, we're still going to make sure we get the best price for this, this company. But we had to move very, very rapidly. I'm sure there must have been a fair amount of demoralization uh, among employees, as well as a high degree of skepticism among customers. How, how did you address those issues? Well, the people felt very let down. A lot of them were completely shell-shocked. They didn't know how this sort of thing could have happened. I mean, people who were not anywhere near the top of the organization were completely sort of dismayed, uh, demoralized. Um, they thought they'd built a great company and they suddenly found everything vanishing in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, as far as customers were concerned, we had two types of customers. The guys who said, look, we will not deal with a, 
a company which is indulged in something like this, and they walked away within the first week. And it was a knee-jerk reaction. We just couldn't do anything about those. But those who hesitate a little, those are the guys we started working on and saying, look, this is not all bad. It's a great company. They've done a phenomenal amount of work, good work in uh, on the software side. And you know, if you stick with them, just just weather this little period, and everything will be good again. And uh, a lot of them, fortunately, stayed back. Great. Well, let's take a step backwards in your career. Uh, uh, when you 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 were you know the, at the head of two of the major companies in the Tata Group, uh, uh, in, in, two, in the year 2000, uh, you you took over at Tata T, uh, and and of course the Tetley acquisition is is very well known. Could you help us understand a little bit of the st strategic thinking that went into your growth plans for the T T Tata T and how you went about? Uh, planning that growth? Actually, the, the acquisition decision had been made before I joined Tarati. I was sort of, my, my, one of my first tasks when I went in was to try to integrate the two companies. But the thinking was very clear and uh, very sound. Uh, Tarati was an old world plantation company. Uh, of course, it had powerful brands in the Indian, Indian, Indian environment, but it was not a, known outside of the shores of India. And the only way to really grow the business geographically across the world was to acquire a major tea, tea company and a major tea brand. And uh, that direction was a very clear direction taken by my predecessors, and I think it's a very good decision. Um, it's really changed the, 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 the type of company Tata Tea was. And um, once in, we in, in what way? Because really, at the end of the day, uh, teas can be sourced from wherever you want. There's no sense force feeding your own teas into brands. You want to really buy the best teas available at the best prices. Uh, the temptation is when you have your own production of tea, you tend to use that in preference to the best teas available for the blends you need. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the tasks I had to do was a, a difficult one, really, to sort of um, get people to focus on the value of teas they were producing and not just the quantity and yields of teas. The temptation in a plantation is to say, look, I've produced X, X percent more than last year, but if the quality isn't what they should have produced, it's really worthless tea. So I had to introduce a system of internal transfer pricing, and every batch of tea produced was actually valued at the price it could get in an auction. So, so that's how we sort of changed the, the value concept of plantations. And then people began to realize that, you know, it wasn't just a question of the quantity produced, but the quality produced. So. Well, you, you very modestly said that uh, the, the, the decision of the acquisition was made earlier and yours was the task of the integration. Very often that is the toughest part after an acquisition. Uh, how, how did you go about doing it and what were some of the lessons learned? Well, I'd done about three or four before that, so it's like uh, this is uh, this is probably my fourth one, and I had to do two more. So I've done about six or seven now. So um, I sort of knew the the basic model, but you know, while there are certain commonalities in all integrations, there'll always be some new uh, thoughts which which come out of an integration. But so could but you the talk us through? Pretty well trodden. Right. Could you talk us through some of the basic models and what was unique in the T situation? Um, well, in, in most integration models, I think two or three things which I insist on is, first of all, what is your integration philosophy? What, do you want to go, what are you going to do? Are you going to just put two companies together? Or are you going to try and build a new company? Or are you going to try and choose the best of both when you make your choices between people and processes and systems? Um, so we decided in this one, and I'm comfortable with this philosophy, I said we'll use best of both. So irrespective of um, who the people, where they come from, which company they come from, where the processes are run best. We said, we'll choose the best of the lot and put together a new company. And I think that worked very well. Um, we also found really that um, although people talk a lot about cultural problems, uh, it's not such a huge issue. Um, I think the mistake people try to make is to change cultures. You've got to understand cultures and respect them. You don't necessarily have to change them. As long as you understand how things are done in a particular culture, and adjust your way to handling that cultural difference, I think that's a far better approach than trying to say, hey, these guys are now, we bought them, they've got to do what we do. There is a difference in culture and you've got to accept it. 
So I think that's, that's always another important learning I've had. And at the end of the day, I think um, most integrations fail because people don't manage the uncertainty which goes with an integration. Uh, you've got to really think about the people, the uncertainty they're going through, lay their fears. Uh, if you put a little bit of caring and you know, employee involvement into integrations, they work much better. So just a couple of things. Uh, that's very sound advice, I would say. Uh, uh, you went through, as you said, uh, a similar exercise with uh, when you were at Tata Chemicals the, in the soda ash industry. Uh, also, uh, acquisitions there. Could you tell us about some of the uh, unique challenges those posed for you? Well, the first one was a British company, Brunamond, which was very similar to the Tetley culture. So that really we could follow most of what was done in Tetley, but we did it a lot faster. We had a hundred day uh, period for doing the, the, all the sort of, all the, what I would call the administrative stuff in integrations was put out of the way in the first hundred days. <clears throat> we also drew up a new strategic plan for the group going forward. And um, this was a company which was owned earlier by private equity. So the moment they felt they were back in the fold of a chemical company, they felt so much better, you know, chemical parent was what they were really looking out for. And I think that we gave them that. Plus they found, you know, they'd been strapped for cash. We had things like R&D. We were doing work in innovation, new technologies, nanochemistry, you know, the sort of stuff fascinated the, the people who, who were working in Brunamont. And they really sort of enjoyed coming into the fold of a large chemical company. So that, that integration went really well. And a few years later, well, 18 months later, we bought General Chemicals, which is a really big American company. And um, this, again, turned out to be a very simple integration because um, I guess, again, cultural difference between the, the British and the Americans, when I said to them, look, we'll do a typical 100-day 100 100 day pro process, they said, why 100 days? Let's do it in 50, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, all gung-ho and ready to go and much more sort of open to change than... Um, the British culture was. They expected jobs to be lost. They expected people to be changed around. They expected changes in hierarchies and responsibilities. Much more sort of ready to accept that. Mm -hmm. So some valuable learnings in those two as well. I mean, one of the uh, things that academic research shows is that a large number of mergers actually end up destroying shareholder value mm -hmm. rather than building it. Uh, what did you learn through your experience about how to uh, prevent that happening? I think you've got to really draw, uh, draw up an action plan for how you're going to build value. Because at the end of the day, that, that's really the, the, the meat of the matter is in, in the value you create out of integration. Unless you have a plan going forward, what you're going to do and how you're going to build that value just doesn't make sense. A lot of integrations tend to focus their attention on cutting costs and thinking that you know, just by synergizing and reducing numbers, they can produce results. But at the end of the day, it's the revenue synergies and the, the sort of expansions, the growths, the new product opportunities which come out of integrations which are far more important. So I'd, I'd sort of focus on the value creation rather than just cutting cost. Right. Uh, if, if I could take you still one step for, for, uh, b uh, further back in your career to the, the almost three decades that you spent in the pharmaceutical uh, business in India with Glaxo and Burroughs Welcome. Uh, what were some of the challenges you faced uh, as a multinational trying to operate in India's pharmaceutical uh, industry, especially yeah. at the time when regulation yeah. was pretty tough? Glaxo was a very unique multinational. And I used to always say when we were running that company that um, it was a multinational with a brown face. Because uh, we, we really thought as Indians, we were manned by Indians. Our, our MD was an Indian from, uh, I think, um, 1975 or 76 onwards. Um, we didn't have an expat. Um, Glaxo had some very strong beliefs. Um, and hats off to the chairman at the time, Sir Paul Girolami who was a really sort of far-sighted, legendary strategist. Um, so Paul said, look, for a country like India, and he said this sometime in the 80s, he says, I don't expect a bottom line out of this country for the next 25 years. And you won't find many chairmen saying something like that. But he said, as long as you do well in your environment, and you're a respected company in the environment in which you operate, I'm, I'm happy. And that philosophy continued for many years thereafter. 
Um, we did, of course, have a lot more profit pressure as, as the years passed. But, you know, that basic sort of approach that India is going to take time. There's no great urgency. Uh, Sir Paul was Italian, and he saw a lot of resemblance between Indians and Italians. And whenever he came to India, he loved India. He used to munch chili, chilies by the dozens, <laughs> and uh, he loved Indian food. And he really sort of uh, thought of us like, you know, almost the same way as he thought of Italians. So it, it gave him a different approach to India and different outlook for India. But I think that that certainly changed the way the group treated India. We sort of uh, sold our medicines in India at, at astoundingly low prices, completely different to other countries around the world. And we had huge volumes. Um, at, at one stage, we were producing something like 48% of the total units produced within the group were sold in, produced and sold in India. So it was that scale of operation. It was really big. It was one of the biggest subsidiaries of the group. And what's the situation today? Is it still uh, the case that uh, uh, multinational pharmaceutical companies would expect not to generate returns, or are things better now? I think now? things have changed because of the patent laws. Once the patent, new patent laws came in the, from 2000 onwards, uh, things have certainly changed. The newer products are definitely sold at much higher prices, and things are changing on the profits front. I think today GlaxoSmithKline is far more profitable than GlaxoWelcome was a few years ago. Where, where would you say are the biggest opportunities for international uh, pharmaceutical companies? Uh, for example, I've heard quite a bit about, uh, you know, possibilities in the rural market. Do you see uh, any prospects there? Or? India will always be a very fast-growing market. But uh, relative to the Western world, uh, price levels will always be low. So they, they, this is something you'd have to accept. Even with a, a completely new molecule, you just cannot charge anywhere near what you would charge in, a, in an overseas market. So pricing is always going to be a bit of a problem in India. And there's always a big brother government sitting over your head and watching. And uh, they would intervene, I think, if, if they found uh, you know, that prices are too high for the Indian market or the Indian consumer. Uh, they have retained um, sort of horrendous powers of compulsory licensing in the patent laws. So you know, they can invoke those provisions if they have to. And they do tend to encourage, uh, you know, um, Indian manufacturers to come in whenever they think that prices are too high. You know, over the course of your career, uh, you've faced lots of different challenges. Uh, which would you regard as your single greatest cha leadership challenge? And how did you overcome it? And what did you learn from it? It's difficult to say which was the greatest challenge, but I think there was a period of time when um, I had to um, learn to manage people. And as I, said, I, was a, I was a functional guy, I was a finance guy, and I was suddenly put in charge of marketing and had a team of 1,400 reps to look after. And these guys were getting unionized. And I think my biggest challenge was to encourage them to move away from external unions and bring them back into the internal fold. And I still look on that as one of my greatest learning experiences. How, how did you go about doing it? I intuitively didn't sort of attack the level of the rep. I attacked the level of the manager they reported to. And I said, if I change, make changes there, then I think I'll, I'll succeed. If I'd gone straight to the rep level, I'd have probably failed. But I got a lot of champions on my side by going to the level of middle management, convincing them that they had to treat their reps differently, and then worked on their bosses to make sure they were treated differently. And then everything fell into place. But it took about two and a half years of hard work. So. Uh, one final question. Uh, one final question. How do you define success? <sighs> something that makes you happy. It's, it's got to be something you feel within you. I don't think uh, a pat on the back, of course, helps. But you know, it's got to be something you feel deep inside that yes, I have succeeded. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining no us today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks. Thank you very much.